If you're in a relationship and you only have five positive interactions to one negative interaction, then the relationship will end. It's too negative. But if you have more than 11 positive interactions to one negative interaction, then it also ends. And you think, well, that's pretty bloody peculiar. Why in the world would that be? Don't you want like a hundred to one positive to negative interactions? And the answer to that is, what makes you think that you want a relationship so that you can be happy? Or at least happy moment to moment? Why do you think that? Maybe in one of your relatively uninformed flurries, you ended up establishing a relationship with someone who was really not good for you. And that might mean, well, they just, it was just a bad personality match. Or it might mean they really weren't good for you because, you know, you can get pretty unlucky and you can get tangled up with someone who's very deceitful and very malevolent and who could care less about you or maybe who even wants to hurt you. And then you can establish a trusting relationship with them or at least you trust them. And then one day, you know, you find out that they are not who they said they were or even more importantly, they are not who you thought they were. And so then maybe you're in a committed relationship and they betray you with someone else. And so then you think, well, there you are at home and you're, you know, you're perfectly happy about being at home and then your partner comes home and for one reason or another you find out that they're having an affair or that they've betrayed you or that they've lied to you in some other spectacularly important way and maybe it's a lover, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a sibling and maybe it's a friend, whatever, it doesn't matter. And so here's a way of thinking about it. The minute before they come home, you're in one place. And you remember, a place isn't just a place, right? A place is a place in time, because we live in space-time, we live in time and place. And what that means is you can be in the same place in one minute and a completely different place in the next minute, even if you haven't even moved. And so place is a very, very complicated idea. So you're sitting at home and you're watching old Oprah and you're perfectly content to do that and then the person comes home and the bottom of your world falls out. And then all of a sudden you're not where you thought you were. And it's a really weird place that you are now because it's not where you were, that's for sure. But you also don't know where it is because you don't know who that person is that's in that room with you. You don't know what your past with them was or what it meant or anything else about it because it was predicated on absolute misperceptions. So none of your memories about those events are valid even though you have them as memories. And then you have a worse problem which is if you're betrayed badly enough not only are you not going to understand your immediate past with that person, oh, and by the way, your future's also gone, so that's a big problem, as is your present has become radically more complex. But it's worse than that, because if you're really betrayed, you're also going to think, who am I that I could be that stupid? And then you're going to think, what is a human being that they can be that corrupt? And so not only have the fundamentals been kicked out of the substructure of your perceptions, but your notion of what it means to be you and what it needs to be human might have been seriously disrupted. And you know, the thing about that is that's a non-trivial event. People call that traumatic. It, it like, and it, and it, it's like a physical wound. In, in fact, it has, certainly if the trauma is great enough, it can produce a psychophysiological wound because that sort of trauma, a deep betrayal is a good example, will damage your brain. And maybe you'll recover from it and maybe you won't. And one of the ways that that's been represented forever in mythological stories is by being swallowed up by a subterranean beast. It's something that comes up from the depths and pulls you down, and then you're in it. Now, why is that? Well, that's an extraordinarily complicated question, but here, here's the answer as nearly as I can tell. We evolved a very complicated neuropsychological system to signal alarm. So that's anxiety, threat, threat sensitivity, right? And that makes us freeze, for example. You want someone, I think, in a relationship that you can spar with. And it's partly because you have hard problems to solve. And if the person that you're with isn't willing to put forward their opinion, then you only have half the cognitive power that you would otherwise have. You know, and hopefully you find someone who's interestingly different from you, like not so different that you can't communicate and you have to be careful of that, but interestingly different and then hopefully they have the ability and the will to express their opinion and then your interest stays heightened and there has to be that tension in a relationship. You know, people think, well, I, I want to get along perfectly with my partner. It's like, no, you, you probably don't. You just get bored and then you go looking for trouble. And so you want a little bit of trouble in the relationship and a little bit of mystery and a little bit of combativeness and, and the ability to exchange opinions forthrightly. And, and I trust her, which is a huge 
element. I mean, when, when we finally did decide to get together permanently, we were both in our later 20s. And, you know, one of the things that I had learned by that point and insisted to her about was that we had to tell each other the truth. And she took to that wholeheartedly, you know, and um, for better and for worse, because truths can be harsh. Well, you know, if, if I tell my wife that she looks good in an outfit, she knows that I mean it. Yeah. And so there's some utility in that. And then if you're silent and say, I don't answer questions, that she, she goes and she changes well, it. Well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, she'll say, you know, do you like this? And yeah. I'll tell her that yeah. I don't. And, yeah. and you know, and, and no, that that's, doesn't that's necessarily useful. make her happy in the moment. Right. But if I do say I like it, she knows that I mean it. And, you know, I actually like her sense of style a lot. So it turns out that 90% of the time, it's pretty easy for me to say, look, I think you look great and mean it. And, uh, you know, she's a fairly harsh standard bearer too. Like she's she's insisted that I stay in whatever reasonable physical shape I happen to be in. You know, that was that was something that she's very demanding of. And I would say that it's the same from my side. And, and we've been good at negotiating, which is, you know, what do you want from a partner fundamentally? What what do you want and need? I mean, the first thing is, is that, well, hopefully you, like I said, you're blessed with the fact that you find each other attractive. And I think it's very difficult for the relationship to begin or proceed or sustain itself without that. But having that, then what do you want? Well, you want someone that you can trust. You want someone that you can build a view of the future with, and you want someone that you can negotiate with. And that's very hard to negotiate with people because they have to tell you what they think. They have to know what they want or figure it out. They have to tell you what they want. They have to be satisfied when they get what they want, which is also a very difficult thing to manage. And you have to continually update that because your life goes through different stages. And she yeah, well, well, and you have to work at that too, right. you know, and, and that's something that people also don't understand because they tend to think that, well, that, that all romantic interaction should be spontaneous. It's like, well, if that's your theory, then you might as well just give up right now if you're going to get married because that, like, the only reason you can think that is because you don't have enough responsibility to make romantic entanglement virtually impossible. And what happens when you're married, especially when you have little kids, is that, and, and you both have a job, let's say, is you're so busy that the probability that you're going to find time for spontaneous mutual interaction is decreases to zero. <laughs> and so if that's what you're hoping for, then you're never gonna have it. And so what you have to do is you have to make time for each other. And you know, if you're dating, um, when you're establishing a relationship, well, you put some effort into it. You know, you decide that you're going to go out for dinner and you dress up to some degree and you know, you try to present yourself to each other in some halfways mutually acceptable manner. And you hope that there's going to be a positive consequence of that, that you're going to find each other attractive. But then people somehow think that once they're married, that the same amount of effort isn't necessary. And that's wrong. 